Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you very much for your word. We know that this is a guide you have given us to lead us from here to the yonder place. And we are praying, O Lord, that we will not neglect your word, but that all you have given us from your word will take heed to you so that we will be able to finish our journey in heaven with you forever in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that the foolish things of the past that have enticed us, attracted us, and drawn us away from you, that you cut those things away from us permanently in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that you'll keep us steady in the will of God, in obedience to the word of God, all the days of our lives, so that not only that others will have testimony about us, but even you, Almighty God, will have testimony concerning our lives. Speak to our hearts now, Lord, and grant us the grace and the strength to stand firm on the unchanging word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. From First Chronicles chapter 16, we're looking at verse 29. First Chronicles chapter 16, from verse 29. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come before him and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That's the exhortation and the word that comes to the people of God. The people that are rightly related unto the Lord. And you find a series of commandments there. It says those who know the Lord ought to give glory unto his name. And those who know that the Lord has done so great things for them and has sacrificed the greatest sacrifice that we could ever imagine so that he can reconcile us unto himself. Such people shall bring a present and offering the sacrifice unto the Lord and come before him ready to worship him in the very beauty of holiness. That is, it takes an heavenly dimension of the grace and the goodness and the mercy of God. It takes something from above, something from outside of us before we can really and truly worship the Lord in an acceptable manner. To worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness means that we should allow heaven to have impact upon our lives. We should allow heaven to deposit the treasure, heavenly treasure of holiness in our lives. Because only then, getting that treasure from on high, can we worship the Lord acceptably. In Psalm 93 verse 5. Psalm 93 verse 5. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Here is uh, the word telling us that our worship depends upon the word of God. Not upon our feeling, not upon human expediency, but that the testimonies of the Lord are very sure. That is the word of God. The mind of God revealed unto men. That it is upon these sure testimonies, the foundations that cannot be shaken, it is upon that we worship the Lord. And then he tells us, Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. As you may already know, when it says, Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. You might think that that is simply talking about the house of God, which will be in the eternal. Because you must remember the word of God that says, And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, which is referring to heaven. Then as you read this, that says holiness becometh thine house forever, you might think that this is only referring to heaven. Because actually, holiness is the central thing in heaven. God is holy. Christ is holy. His very throne upon which he sits is holy. The angels, of course, are the holy angels. And that is a holy place. Here from heaven, thy holy place of abode. Then you might think this is just referring to the fact that after we have died, after we have gone to the very presence of God, the uninterrupted worship of the people of God will be characterized by holiness. That is true, but that's limited. When you remember that when Jacob was going on his way, and there was no building, there was not even an altar, there was no shelter. And yet, he was lying on the bare ground with his stone, his pillow. 
Then he saw a vision of the Lord. Angels passing up and down. When he woke up, he said, This is the house of God, the gate of heaven. Well then, that means that a person that has known the Lord, and the Lord is visiting him, and the Lord Jesus Christ has become the ladder upon which that individual is sending his thought, his imagination, his desires, his motives unto heaven, and is having heavenly communications with, with the Lord, then you know that even though he might be alone or lonely like Jacob, if that place is visited by the very presence of God, because a child of God is there, that is the very house of God. There was not a partner, a second person with Jacob. And yet that place was referred to as the house of God. Well then do you realize you are a child of God? You have the presence of God. You have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And you have this heavenly visitation upon your life every time. All around you is the presence and the power of God. Where you are is the house of God. Holiness becomes that place from now on forever. Not only that, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. If you become two or three, or you become ten or fifteen or whatever, the number may be in a house fellowship perhaps. And you know that the word of God is there. You are praying in that place. You are giving your testimony there. That also is the house of God. It doesn't have to be a big tabernacle, a big temple, or a big synagogue before it becomes the house of God. It says, holiness becomes thine house. Even that little place where few of you are meeting together, it is the house of the Lord. Holiness becomes thy house, O Lord, forever. Then when we come to a meeting like this on Sunday, you must remember that when Jesus Christ appeared in the temple, a place where they should be praying, a place where they're giving the offering, a place where the reading of the word was going on, a place where the teacher, the preacher, the shepherd will stand up and declare the word of truth unto the people. Jesus called that place the house of God. He said, do not make my father's house a den of robbers, which means then in an assembly like this. When we come together, this also is the house of God and holiness becometh thy house, O Lord, forever. Are we going to forget the New Testament that tells us that you as a believer, an individual believer, you are the very temple of God, which means then, you as an individual believer, you are the very house of God. You become the habitation of God. He wants to dwell in you according to the promise he has given us in Second Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 16 all through to verse 18. I will walk in them. I will dwell in them. I will be to them God, and they shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord. It means then, you as an individual believer, you are the very habitation of God. And when you put everything together, the believer, the place where he prays, has his quiet time, experiences the presence of God, the place where he joins with other members of the body of Christ, they may be two or three, they may be ten or twelve, or the place where thousands gather together to become the temple, the tabernacle, the place of worship, or just the body of that believer. That is the house of God. And holiness becometh thy house, O Lord. Not only for one day, for one week, for one month, for one year, for a few years, but forever. Holiness becometh the house of the Lord. There should be uninterrupted holiness in the believer in the family of believers and in the congregation of the saints of God. Holiness unto the Lord. Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14 verse 20. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bulls before the altar. Here it tells us holiness unto the Lord. That whatever they are, you know that in the Old Testament, they used quite a lot of things to show some symbols in their worship. They killed a lot of animals, and those animals were to be without blemish. And the priests that offered them, they too were to be clean and pure and holy before the Lord. And the place where those sacrifices were made, those places were to be clean and pure and holy before the Lord. And it tells us that in that day shall, there shall be upon the bells of the horses. That is, the horses that are also used uh, amidst the children of Israel. That even upon the bells on them will be holiness unto the Lord. If the Lord desires that holiness shall be symbolized in writing. 
Holiness should be symbolized in sacrifice. Holiness should be symbolized amidst the people of God, whether on the battlefield while riding their horses, or in the synagogue while making their offering, or as they related with one another, if the Lord desired holiness in the old covenant like that, how much more in the new covenant? In the new covenant, it shall still be holiness unto the Lord. In fact, the promise the Lord has given is that he will so recreate us. He will so cleanse us that we will live in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. In Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. All the days of our life. Any day in your life that holiness is missing, there is a day that is lost. It's a day of sorrow. It's a day when God is not getting the glory. It's a day when the reason for your existence is not being fulfilled. It's a day when the purpose of Calvary is not being fulfilled in your life. It's a day when the new covenant is made lower than the old covenant. It's a day when you should hang your head in shame because a day has been lost to the hands of the devil because the very purpose of your existence after you are born again is that you will live in holiness and righteousness before the Lord all the days of your life. And it, it is not just Sunday holiness. Neither is it Monday holiness or Thursday holiness or fellowship day holiness. It is every day, the ordinary day, the normal day, the regular day in your life should be characterized by holiness and righteousness. In holiness and righteousness before God all the days of our life. That's why today we're considering this message, holiness unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. What will that signify to you? It should signify that you, your, the totality of your personality, should be offered to the Lord without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle, without sin, without iniquity, without anything that is false. You are offered unto the Lord, completely holiness unto the Lord. Well then, if you also look at every area of your life, it will mean that your conversation is offered before the Lord in holiness unto the Lord. It will mean that every, every condition of your life and every character, everything that you do, shall be offered unto the Lord. Holiness unto the Lord. It should mean that every step you are taking in life, it should be something you can offer unto the Lord as holiness unto the Lord. It should be that every sacrifice and every decision and every desire should be offered unto the Lord as holiness unto the Lord. In fact, you should examine anything and everything that you do and should ask yourself, can I offer this unto the Lord as holiness unto the Lord? This action, this decision, this conversation, this discussion I'm having with so and so, this thought I'm having and entertaining in my mind, this desire that I'm harboring within me, brooding over in my heart, can I offer this when everything is eventually accomplished and fulfilled? And when, so to say, the egg is ashed, can I offer the fruit of it as holiness unto the Lord? The step I take, the dress I wear, the things I eat, the friends I have, the places I go, all that I do and all that I refuse to do, everything I get involved in, can I offer this as holiness unto the Lord? Those private conversations between husband and wife, those private conversations between friend and friend, and those private things, imaginations and desires that we allow in our hearts and lives, can I offer this unto the Lord as holiness unto the Lord? Holiness becometh thy house. My heart is within this body, and this body is the temple of the Lord, the house of God. Everything within there demands holiness. Holiness becometh thine house. Not only that, I should realize that I'm to worship God in the beauty of holiness. And we're not among the people that are worshiping God only on Sunday. Every day, every moment of the day is a worship unto the Lord. And if we're going to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, it means that at no time should we allow anything unclean, anything inappropriate, anything unscriptural in our lives because we're to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. When you think about that, anything that is not holy is ugly. 
in the sight of God, in the sight of a child of God, it doesn't matter what the people of the world are saying about it. It doesn't matter how the people of the world appreciate it, exalt it, and how the people of the world are recommending it. They may call it beauty. They may call it by whatever name, aesthetics or whatever. If it is not contributing to the holiness of life that a child of God ought to live in, it is not holiness, it is ugliness in the sight of God. And therefore you want to realize that the Lord is calling us to a life of holiness. Holiness unto the Lord. You get to the point where you offer everything within, without, around, everything concerning you as holiness unto the Lord. Even the very thoughts you allow in your heart. Holiness unto the Lord. Let's look at three points. Number one, God's nature and commandment. God's nature and commandment. I'm sure you know those two things go together. A man will issue command according to his nature. You look at a people, look at a husband, and examine the kind of authority he wills and the kind of commandments he gives out that will reflect his nature. And you look at a wife and look at the kind of things she demands and the kind of things she wants and says, this is what I must have. It will reveal her nature, the kind of nature that she possesses. And you look at, uh, at people that have uh, some authority over us. The kind of commandment they give and the kind of authority they try to wield and the kind of things they demand will reflect their nature. The same thing, the commandment of God reflects the nature of God. God's nature and commandment. Number two, examples of gracious, holy living. Examples of gracious, holy living. That word gracious at the very center of that uh, phrase it tells you that there may be some kind of holy living. It may not be so gracious. It may just be a rigid kind, a graceless kind. It may just be a carnal kind. It may just be a human kind. It may just be a legalistic kind. But this one we're talking about is gracious, holy living. Examples of gracious, holy living. Number three. Practical, scriptural help for holiness. Practical, scriptural help for holiness. Number one, God's nature and commandment. It goes without saying. That is, we do not need to belabor the point. We do not need to spend so much time proving to you that God is a holy God. If you believe in God at all, you know that he is a holy God. The Bible says so. Our conscience says so. And everyone in the world that actually believes in the true God, the God of heaven, will affirm that God is a holy God. In Psalm 145, Psalm 145, verse 17, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. That means his character is holy. His nature is holy. Everything about him, his actions are holy. Everything he ever planned, everything he ever did, everything is holy. When you think about God, about the true God, you know that this is the very center of his nature. The holiness, the righteousness, the justice, the purity, the perfection. It says the Lord is righteous. At any time you are considering the nature of God, he is at that time righteous. In the eternal past, in the real present, in the eternal future, the Lord is always righteous and always holy. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. His ways with any man. His ways with any woman. His ways with any group of people. In the ways of the Lord, in dealing with any group of people or with a nation or group of nations, the Lord is righteous in all his ways. If you understood all the details about the ways of God, what you will find out is that there is righteousness beneath it, at the center of it, on top of it. Every fabric, every strain, every strand in it will be righteousness and holiness because he is holy in all his works. In Exodus chapter 15 verse 11. Exodus 15 verse 11. Here is a question, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises and doing wonders. We are, we are told there that he is glorious in holiness. He is glorious in holiness. His holiness is when the, when the angels look at the holiness of God, they also see the glory of the holy God. And when human beings were redeemed by his grace, 
human beings who have been enlightened by the word of God, human beings who have revelation of the spirit of God, when they look at God and they look at the nature of God, they cannot help but cry out that God is glorious in holiness. We know about our Lord Jesus Christ because he came to this world and revealed to us who God really is. Because he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you want to know the Father, just look at my life. Because he was a full representation of the Almighty God. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2, he has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory. That's Jesus Christ, the brightness of the glory of God and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So then we're told that Jesus Christ is the express image of the person of the Father. The express image of the Father. What do you expect then if the Father is holy? and perfect, and pure, and just, and righteous. What do you expect of Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, who is the image, the perfect, express image, the brightness of the glory of the Father? Of course, he too is holy. In uh, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. For such an high priest... Referring to Jesus Christ, such an high priest became us, who is holy and harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told that in nature, in character, in life, in everything that he did, in everything that he said, he was holy. God is holy. Christ is holy. And of course, the Holy Spirit, when you really talk about the Spirit of God, many times the Bible will say the Spirit of God. Sometimes the Spirit of the Lord. But then, you know that most of the time, when you mention the Spirit of God, you actually refer to Him as either the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Telling us that God is the triune God and is thrice holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The Father is holy, the Son is holy, and the Spirit of God is holy as well. In fact, He is referred to as the Spirit of Holiness in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. Romans chapter 1, verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Referring to the Holy Spirit there, he is referred to as the Spirit of holiness. Therefore, you know that the nature of God tells us that he is holy. Habakkuk tells us it's of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. It is out of this holiness of the nature of God that the commandment of God comes out to you and to me. Very important. Out of the holiness of God, the perfection of God, the purity of God, out of the very fact that it's of purer eyes than to behold iniquity, out of the very fact that anything unholy, anything unrighteous will be strange to his nature, strange to his character. It is out of that he gives us commandments. And he gives everyone the commandments. And the Lord cannot condone sin in anyone. He cannot cover up sin with anyone or anyone. Because that will be contrary to his nature. His nature demands that all those who are going to be in fellowship with him will remain holy and righteous. Not only holy in the past, but holy in the present. And having the mind and the desire, the decision to remain holy as long as they live. Because they know that that is the only thing that will bring glory unto the Lord. Let's look at the commandments of God now. Understanding that these commandments are coming out of the very nature of the Lord himself. Which is the nature of holiness. In First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Reading from verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. He tells us the reason for the commandment is its nature. Be ye holy, 
Why? Because that makes me feel convenient. Be ye holy because other people around you will be expecting that you are holy. Be ye holy because, well, if you are holy, many blessings will come to your life. Be ye holy because, you know, if you are holy, you'll be getting nearer and nearer the very nature of the angels. Be ye holy because, you see, if you are holy, many good things will come your way and many answers will come to your prayer. All those things are true, but they are not the basic, major, central reason why we are called unto holiness. It says, be ye holy for I am holy. That commandment of holiness is coming out of the very nature of God. And if you know the nature of God, and if you know that you are going to have fellowship with that holy God, he commands that you have to be holy. Come on to verse 14. As obedient children. Those are the only kind of children that will live with God forever. As obedient children. Those are the only kind of children that have a proof and evidence that they are truly reconciled unto God. As obedient children. These are the only children that have the evidence that they have visited Calvary. They know Jesus Christ. They belong to the body of Christ. As obedient children. These are the only kind of children that have their names in the book of life. You don't have the rebellious children. The children in whose mind, in whose heart, in whose spirit, the spirit of the age is working. The people that are being controlled by the devil, you do not have them in the book of life. The evidence that we are in the book of life, we are in fellowship with God, we are worshipping God acceptably, is that we are obedient children. It means that we are obeying scripture. It means that we are obeying the truth that we have learned. It means that we are not modifying the word of God. We are not changing the word of God, altering the word of God. We are obeying the revelation of the truth of the word of God that has come unto us. It also means we are obeying the promptings of the spirit of God at the time the spirit is speaking to us according to the word of God. It means that we are being conformed day by day to the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ as obedient children. Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Now this is talking to us about human responsibility. There are people that tell us that God has predestined them. God has elected them. God has chosen them. And whatever they do, actually it's not they doing it. They say that God is responsible for everything that they do. But here the Lord is telling us, not fashioning yourself. You are the one fashioning yourself, molding yourself, leading yourself in a particular direction. You cannot steal and say, well, it's not me because my life has been predestined by God. It's what God wants me to do that I'm doing. And you cannot commit immorality and say, well, it's not my fault. If God uh, were really not uh, making me do what I did, how could I have done that? You cannot say everything I do, whether it is foolish, unreasonable, sinful, carnal, unscriptural. You cannot say everything is just a work of God. No, you are responsible. God saves you. God gives you his grace. And if you are willing to live a righteous life, the grace of God is available to you. And this verse tells us human responsibility. Human responsibility, not functioning yourselves according to your former laws, in your ignorance, your former laws. When you were still a sinner before you were born again, there were things you were doing. And you cannot say, well, when God likes, he'll take all those things away from my life. I used to do this, I used to do this, I used to do that, that's just my nature. And now I've given myself to Jesus Christ and I've told the Lord, any things that need to be changed in my life, oh Lord, go ahead and change it. So if those things are not changed, what can I do? That's the way God wants me to be. No, not fashioning yourselves according to your former laws. There will be a definite break away from your former character, your former desires, your former ambitions, your former laws, and the thing that motivated your life in the past. Not fashioning yourselves according to your former laws in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy. Recognize the position of the one who has called you, the greatness of the one who has called you, the authority of the one who has called you, the grace of the one that has called you, and the nature of the one that has called you, as he which has called you is holy. So be ye holy in the imperative, a command. Something that you cannot say, well, I I'll consider it. I'll see whether I will do it or not. Be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Not just in a part of your life, in a part of your relationship, in a part of your activities. In all manner of life, in all your manner of conversation. And it says then, because it is written. This is giving us the reason for verse 15. Be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Why? 
Why am I to be holy? Why am I to live a spotless life, a pure life? Why am I to be perfect? Because it says, it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. Your call to holiness depends on the very nature of God, which is the nature of holiness. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Again, here is a commandment of the Lord. This is not just a desire. You know, there are some things that a person might desire. A person might just say, I desire that uh, the church will be like this. I desire that the church will be having revival. I desire that the church should be having the power of God. I desire that this should be happening, that should be happening. Desires are very good. But this one is not just a desire. It's not just a suggestion. It's a very commandment of the Lord. It says, follow peace with all men. That's going to take the grace of God. But that's a commandment of God. Follow peace with all men. All men. The Lord knows that some men are going to enjoy you. Some men are going to say things you didn't appreciate. Some men are going to say something about you that literally will give you almost running stomach, headache, and will give you troublous time, real trials. And yet the Bible says even with those men that say things you wouldn't appreciate, things that will almost be very inconvenient for your life, things that will be like an oppression, affliction upon your heart, upon your life, follow peace with all men. The Lord knows that as we're on this side of heaven, this side of the grave, some people are going to be living with us that we're going to be wondering, are these human beings or animals? Some people are going to get into business deals with us that we're going to think, are these church people or are these servants of messengers of the devil? And yet the Bible is saying, follow peace with all men. You know, some people are going to uh, come across your way that if you are going to yield to uh, the human kind of uh, uh, the human kind of disposition, you are going to spend all your life in the court of the land. Because every, every year, almost every month, if you are an active person, you are active this way, active that way, you are going to find people that you will wonder, how could they do this? And if you don't remember the Bible, you are going to spend all your lifetime in the court. But it says, follow peace with all men, literally all men. The difficult ones and the troublesome ones, the quarrelsome ones, and the people that I had to live with, follow peace with all men. Always understand that only the people that are making peace are the people that are the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers because they are the children of God. And if you are going to really be with the Prince of Peace at last, you need to follow peace with all men. And you know, if you are saying, well, my husband is such an individual that I don't know I'll be able to follow peace with that individual. That might be the stumbling block on your way to heaven. And if you are saying that my wife is such a character that uh, not one day can pass until we have a quarrel, that might just be the stumbling block between you and heaven. But if you are going to make heaven, here is the commandment of the Lord. And we cannot change this. Follow peace with all men. And you know, you have no, uh, you have no hand in where you were born. You were born in that place, in that village, in that locality. And maybe where you are living now, uh, many circumstances have come together and there you are. And it's, it's a troublesome spot on the face of the earth. And yet, even in that place, even in those conditions, the word of God says, if you remember eternity, if you remember living with God, if you know you want to be with God eternally, follow peace with all men. But that's not the end. Oh, I wish that were the end because... That is even difficult enough without the grace of God. That is even difficult enough without constant prayerfulness. That is even difficult enough without crucif if we didn't crucify ourselves to the cross. It's very difficult, almost impossible to follow peace with all men. If that were the end, it would be a lifetime job to keep on following peace with all men, with all women, with all the in-laws, with all the troublesome people. And yet it said that is not even the end of the journey. If you try to do that without the holiness that is added unto it, you might still miss heaven and be cast away forever and ever. Who says that it is so easy to just get savories up your hand and, uh, and then you're on your way to heaven already? Who says without prayer, without crucifixion, without self-denial, without holiness, we can get to heaven? It's a lie. The way of heaven is not a way that is filled with roses. It says follow peace with all, with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You see, there are many things that may hinder you. 
from considering holiness as a center of your very life. And some of the things that hinder holiness are sometimes very useful to some human beings and uh, very important to them, but they are useless in the sight of God without holiness. Think of many things that a person could have without holiness. It's very easy to have money without holiness. In fact, it is difficult to have much money with holiness. Think about it. Think about it. That may take you a whole year to understand. Very difficult to have much money with holiness. That will take a long time for you to understand. But it is very easy to have money without holiness. It's very easy to have a wife without holiness. It's very difficult to have wife according to the will of God with holiness. Because do you know that there are even women that if you are holy as the Bible wants holiness, you're not talking about yourself, you're not bragging, you're not flattering yourself, you are not in the show and in the flat tree and in the praise of men and all the fun fear of the world and you don't have all these worldly things if you were to strictly keep to the word of God and, and be holy. Do you know there are women that even call the same Christians that will, that will avoid you? Oh, it's very difficult to have real wife with holiness. It's very easy to have wife without holiness. It's very easy to have husband without holiness. It's very easy to have position without holiness. And that is what you are finding today in many places and perhaps in our midst. That there are people that will keep a position of authority. But then they keep that position of authority not because they are holy. In fact, they have to do a lot of things. We heard about David today trying to keep his respect after he lost self-respect. Trying to keep position after he lost his relationship with the Lord. Trying to keep authority after he lost the respect of the people around him. Trying to keep everything by all means. A person can keep the position of a king and the position of a preacher and the position of a leader and the position of a coordinator and the position of bishop or whatever without holiness. So what is very difficult is to have position and holiness. Very, very difficult. Even in a Bible church like this, very, very difficult to have holiness and a person that is only looking up to God, only looking up, only looking to the scriptures, only walking by the way of God and will not fear any man, will not tend to anything, will not cringe, will, will just live a life of holiness. Very, very difficult for people because, you know, when they are making recommendations, they hardly recommend those people. They say he doesn't talk much. We don't know whether he knows anything or not. All the time he's prayerful. He doesn't consider the human aspect and the human dimension. All the son is just Bible, Bible. He's too fanatical about Bible. And he will not even try to modify a little. Because he's too bent on holiness standard. It's very difficult for those people to have holiness. But if you're like that, I want to encourage you. Give up the position. Don't worry that they're not calling you to a particular thing. Keep on in that holiness. Because money doesn't take us to heaven. Position doesn't take us to heaven. And the uh, respect that people have for us doesn't take us to heaven. Authority that we wield in the society doesn't take us to heaven. Whatever it is we have on earth doesn't take us to heaven. There is one thing that takes us to heaven. And that is the gracious holiness of the Lord in our lives. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You know there was a time in this church when the only thing that anybody considered is how am I in the sight of God? Am I holy in the sight of God? Am I righteous in the sight of God? If the trumpet sounded now, will I be able to go? Am I so right and so pure and so perfect in the sight of God that if God decided he could take me away like Enoch, like he took Enoch away, there was a time like that when the only thing we considered, we didn't cons in fact, at that time, we didn't have any title for pastor. All we had was a Bible study leader. We didn't have any title for coordinator or for moderator or for house fellowship or for area leader. Or for, we didn't have anything like that. All we had was evangelism team. And you know, you, you just went to evangelize. There was a time we didn't even have any title for worker. You know, today, uh, when people are asking questions, they say they are workers. They say as a leader. They say as a zonal leader. They say, uh, there was a time we didn't have that. All we had at that time was holiness unto the Lord. And the only thing that concerned us was not keeping that position. The only thing that concerned us was keeping that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The change of emphasis. Not in the preaching. 
not in the teaching, the change of emphasis in the minds of many people. I must grab my position, keep my position, emphasize my position. That change is making holiness to go to the background. And when holiness goes to the background like that, a lot of people also that are keeping to that position without holiness, they go to the background. And when we get to heaven, we may not see them. Because you follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So then, we find the commandment of the scripture. We cannot read everything, but you know that in the scriptures we have the commandments of the Lord that we should be holy unto the Lord. The question is, is that possible at all? That a person will be holy? Don't be quick in answering. Is it possible at all that a person in this dirty world, this dirty environment, with all the situations and many happenings even within the church, within the district, within the locality, is it possible at all that one shall be holy? Oh yes, it is possible. But I dare tell you that the disciples asked a question from the Lord. They said, are there few that be saved? And Jesus Christ said, you strive to enter in. And at another time, he gave us the indication that very few, very few, in comparison with the people that go to church, in comparison with the people that carry the Bible, in comparison with the people that name the name of Christ, in comparison with the population of the world, when you compare the people that get to heaven with the people that profess to know the Lord, very few eventually will get there. But for those few, those who make up their minds, that there's only one assignment God has given them on earth, that they must make sure that they do and that that assignment must not be allowed to suffer which is to be holy unto the lord they will take all other things in church in the world in the family anywhere they'll take them with loose hands but they'll grip holiness very family the people who are going to do that are going to be very few and those are the few people that are going to be able to make it eventually. That's what the Bible says. And if you make up your mind that you'll be among the few, then you really need to have that extra grace of God. And distinguish yourself, separate yourself from the multitude of people that are just ordinary, nominal churchgoers. And they're not thinking of that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Let's look at these examples. Very few, but thank God they are there. In Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, reading from verse 22. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. You might be wondering, how could a man live 300 years walking with God without debating at all? Without disobeying the word of God at all? Without going astray at all, how could a man live 300 years walking with the Lord? Didn't he have problems? Didn't he have people that tried to annoy him? And we're told this was a married man because he begat Methuselah and he also begat sons and daughters, which means he had more than two children. In fact, sons, he had more than two sons. Daughters, he had more than two daughters. And when you think of a person having five children, having six children, you know if you're a father, if you're a mother, how difficult it is to live a holy life with all these poor kids running after you and doing things you don't want them to do. And yet it says Enoch, a married man with children, he walked with God 300 years. So asking, how could he do that? He did that by living a day at a time. You don't live 300 years in, at a time. The temptations of uh, 300 years are not going to be uh, put inside one day. It's a little walk, a step at a time. And it doesn't matter how many years we have to live. You have to live a moment at a time. A minute at a time. A day at a time. It's a day that will eventually become two days. And you look back and say, yesterday, I had the grace of God. Thank God yesterday, he kept me. Thank God the temptations that came yesterday. I remember the word of God and I was able to stand. And here, here we are today. I don't need to worry about yesterday anymore. And I don't need to be jubilating and dancing and jumping up and saying, Look at the victory I got yesterday. Yesterday is gone, never to come again. And I don't need to worry about tomorrow. Will I be able to stand tomorrow? I leave that in the hands of God. Will there be temptation tomorrow that will sweep me away off my feet? I leave that to the hands of the Lord. It will it be so difficult tomorrow to live a clean life, a perfect life, a pure heart? A a, a holy life, I leave that to the hands of the Lord just today. 
just today in the office, just today in the home, just today in the market, just today in the presence of a friend, just today in the presence of an enemy, just today in the presence of a persecutor, a tempter, just today. It is today, just a day at a time. Little drops of water make a mighty ocean. And it is the little grain of sand that makes all the sand you see on the shore. And it is the little grain of rice that makes the whole bag of rice that becomes almost uncountable. It is one by one by one by one. And that is the way that Enoch lived the life. Uh, the, the secret is not to give up because I know that what is happening today that the Lord cannot give me the grace. What is happening today that I cannot just go on my knees if it becomes so tense. That the devil would like to push me to say things I shouldn't say. Why shouldn't I be wise and just keep my mouth shut if I don't know what to say? If the devil is trying to make the water of life so troublesome that a person will say something, he forgets himself. Why doesn't he go into his house and lock the door and just be in the sight of the Lord if he doesn't know what to say so that he will not offend with his mouth? Why doesn't he just lie down before the Lord, kneel down before the Lord and just keep quiet before the Lord and say, Lord, you understand, but keep me holy. That this situation that is happening today, I know it will pass. I know it will, it will go away eventually, but before it goes away, keep me holy if you'll make sure that you live a day at a time you wouldn't know when you have lived a whole year of holiness in fact you wouldn't know when you have lived five years of holiness ten years of holiness and how many years are we going to live many of us who are here maybe you have barely 20 years more 30 years more 40 years more if jesus tarries if you have 30 years more look at a man that had 300 years what's our problem the grace of God is there. Jesus Christ is there. The cross of Christ is there. The power of the Lord is there. The word of God is there. And Enoch, not having church or pastor or Bible or fellowship or other people to encourage him, he lived 300 years and was righteous and holy before the Lord. Eventually, the Lord took him away. Obviously, then, if we really wanted to follow the Bible, we can follow the word of God. We can be holy. And we'll be holy in Jesus' name. In First Samuel chapter 12, for Samuel chapter 12, reading from verse 3. Behold, here am I, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose socks have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Or whose whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? I will restore it to you. And they said, Thou has not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. Now, I know we know this uh, passage of scripture, many of us are students of the Bible. But I want us to read uh, this passage of scripture today with uh, a kind of a uh, different attitude. I want you to read it like this. I want you to think about it like this. That this Samuel, he had been taken away from his family. And he was brought into uh, the house of Eli so that he can be in the temple from his very young age. It wasn't up to five years, if you look at your Bible very well, when he was weaned. Because it just means that uh, at the time he stopped sucking the breast of the mother, then he was brought into the temple. And yet, from that time on, think about it. From that time on, he saw Ophni and Phinehas, those were bad people. And Eli was not a person that was a great teacher, a mighty teacher, an effective teacher of the word of God laying line upon line and precept upon precept. Eli was an indulgent, careless father. He wasn't a disciplinarian as such. You can know that from the life of Eli. And also you will know that he didn't know too much of the mind of God. When God was calling Samuel, saying Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel did not know it was the Lord calling him, he went to Eli. Eli did not immediately know it was the voice of the Lord. He was not a great discipler. Somebody who could disciple another person and bring that person up in the proper way of the Lord. That was the situation in which Samuel lived. And Samuel saw the example of the people that were cheating. Of the people that were covetous. Of the people that will take a big fork and go into the place and say, Give us flesh now. If you don't give us, we'll take it right now. He saw all those examples. You know why some people say they cannot live holy lives? Oh, they say, you know, in my, I was holy before I got job. I was holy before I got to my new environment. In my new environment, they don't line up. 
in my new environment they don't take things belonging to them they just take everything by force and i was still gentle for the first month for the six months i got there but when i saw that if i continue like this i would almost always be at the back bench they will never consider me for promotion they'll never consider me for what is my due what is my right eventually i became like them so that i could claim my right samuel never did that now as you look at samuel he didn't have all these sunday messages all these Monday outlines, all these thoughts, thoughts, the encouragement and revival time, and all the house fellowship, and all the radio ministration. Samuel didn't have all that. And what kind of preaching was he listening to? Because Eli was even an old man in his 90s. And you see this Eli did not have the word of, he was, very, he was not very strong on the word of God. He was an old, old man whose eyes were very dim. And Samuel could do anything. And yet you see this Samuel, he lived a holy life. You have Bible, you have teaching, you have cassettes, and you have encouragement. Counseling is available. If we cannot live a holy life, Samuel will condemn us. But then turn this scripture around in this way. Watch if you look at Samuel now, and obviously, after more than 60 years of ministry, obviously, because Samuel was now old. He had been there before he was 10 years of age. He was himself now an old man because we are told in verse 2, I am old and gray headed. He was now very old, more than 60 years have gone. And now he came before the people and he said, I am here with you. Witness against me before the Lord. Don't hide anything, we are before the Lord. Don't cover up anything, we are before the Lord. And before is anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Or whom have I oppressed? Of whose hand have I taken bribe? Any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith. I want you to think of yourself. You have only been a coordinator now for three years. Or perhaps for four years. Or perhaps for five years. Little time. Not 60 years yet. Can you stand before all the people you have led? And you say, feel free. Don't be intimidated by anybody and anything. We're all before the Lord. And before he's anointed. Whom have I oppressed? Five years now. And if those people were really to be before the Lord without any intimidation. Don't you think you have some hands raised up? Now, Samuel. Sixty years have gone. More than that. And yet, he could stand before them. And he could ask them, look at my life. You've seen me when I was bare, since I was very young. What have I done to blind my eyes and not to act according to truth, according to righteousness, according to the holy way of the Lord? And he said in verse 4, and he said, thou hast, def thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. What a testimony, what a wonderful thing, that such people could live such lives. Before Christ came, before the full revelation of the canon of scripture was given, and before the death of Christ on the, on the cross of Calvary, and before all the privileges we have in the church and in the spirit of God, there were people like Samuel, examples of gracious, holy living. We're now in Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, reading from verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, as thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man, an upright man, one that feareth God and is choice evil. Well, we've been talking about Samuel. And in the case of Samuel, he was asking human beings. And those human beings might have forgotten some things. And those human beings might be so weak in their consideration, might be so blinded because of their appreciation that they will not even want to remember, they will not even remember anything that someone had done wrong. There's a possibility of that. Here we come to the case of Satan himself. And God told Satan, he said, Satan, I have one man on earth. And you have just told me now in verse 7 that you have been going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down in it. Have you seen somebody there? Have you seen one man called Job, my servant? Have you seen there is none like him on the earth? Once again, let's remember that Job was a married man. And let us remember that his wife was not 
at the highest point of spirituality, if we can put it that way. Because some of us uh, feel, well, I would really have been righteous were it not for my wife. I would have been righteous were it not for the fact that my wife is not equally as spiritual as I am. Think about Job. And understand that his wife was not at the highest level, at the highest point of spirituality. And he had children, ten children. And these children too were not at the highest point of spirituality. Because Job will say, I will sacrifice on their behalf. Who knows, in their feast and in their merriment, they might have abused God or cursed God. I'm going to sacrifice on their behalf. But Job, having ten children, having a wife, a person having a wife will have in-laws. And when you think of his friends, the friends eventually that came, you know they were not the best friends. Because when those things happened to him, you know they were accusing him. How God told them eventually in the latter chapters that you have not spoken right concerning me. Those were the friends of Job. With all those circumstances around Job, God asked Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth? One out of a million. One out of many people. God didn't say, not like him in the city. He was beyond everyone in the city. Not like him in the nation. Beyond everyone in the nation. Not like him in the earth. A perfect man, upright man. One that feareth God and hates evil. Runs away from evil. Detests evil. And Satan, Satan the accuser of the brethren. You know if there could be any error, any flaw, Satan would be quick to point it out. But Satan couldn't find anything. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Yes, I know he fears you, but does, does Job fear God for naught, for nothing? Hast thou not made an edge about him, about his house, about all that he has on every side? And thou hast blessed the work of his hands? A rich man, pure, holy, and righteous. is something almost unheard of now in the world. Rich man, prosperous man. A man having land, having property, having cattle, having children, having a lot of things, having more than he needs, and yet righteous and pure. If it could happen to Job, then it can happen to anyone that is willing today. It's not going to be all that easy because the people that are working with you are almost going to put that holiness in the mud and they're going to say, uh, master or boss or whatever, it's always considered holiness, holiness, holiness. Uh, if we're still on that holiness in the world of today, are we going to prosper? That's what the people working with you will say. And if you are not willing to deal with sin among the people that are working with you because you want to keep the prosperity and everything, the holiness cannot remain. But even Satan could not point accusing finger. The accuser of the brethren. He said, yes, I know. But I think it's because you have blessed him. That is why he's been having that kind of loyalty, obedience and righteousness and holiness unto you. These examples are examples of people that live the life that ought to be lived. And if they could do it, I believe we can do it by the grace of God. In Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Reading from verse 3. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was found in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Over the whole realm. Then the president and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault. That's an extraordinary man. A man that enjoyed the grace of God. Then it says, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Once again, you can see an individual. He was in the Babylonian captivity. He had been shifted from his root. And even though he was in a strange land in exile, yet he kept himself. From the very beginning he got into that kingdom, he purposed in his heart that he will not defile himself. And uh, kings have come and gone. And yet here was Daniel still standing after many years. And he was still not defiling himself. And the people could bear testimony that he was actually living a life according to the will, according to the word of God. They said they couldn't find any occasion against him concerning the worship of God, concerning anything in the kingdom. Except if they will just lay down a law that will make him to want this, to disobey his God. And then they know he will never want to do that. And then they will be able to get him into trouble. Righteous man, holy man. What an example. And you see, these were people that lived holy and righteous in dirty environment. Think of Babylon. 
Think of all the magic in Babylon. Think of all the promiscuity and all the evil immorality in Babylon. Think of the idol worship in Babylon. Think of the tyrant and the authority and that is Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And yet in the midst of it all, he was able to live a life that was to the glory of God. In Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 14. Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, says the Lord God. Here God himself testified to the righteousness of, of some men. And he said, if, even if they were in a particular city, that the city was so polluted that these people would only be able to deliver their souls by their own righteousness and holiness. They will not be able to deliver others by their righteousness and holiness. How do you understand that? It's just like the foolish virgins talking to the wise virgins. Give us of your oil because our own is running out. And then they said, go and buy for yourself. We cannot give you. Our righteousness cannot cover you. Our holiness cannot cover you. The grace of God in our lives cannot cover you. Lest it be not sufficient for you and, and us. So God was saying their righteousness, their holiness would only be sufficient for them. They will not be able to transfer to other people. What practical things do we do? Scriptural things do we do? To receive help, assistance, support, to live the holy life. Well, that brings us to point number three. Practical, scriptural help for holiness. Obviously, you know that the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is, without meeting Christ and making him your personal savior, holiness will always be foreign to your lifestyle. But the very beginning of receiving help from above in becoming holy is that you will be born again. You will be born again. That means you will turn away from sin, from all your heart, with all your heart. You take a firm decision. You are turning away from all sin. And you are calling upon the name of the Lord. And after you have had that full repentance, genuine repentance, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you on the cross of Calvary. And then after that, you will continue living a life that is bringing honor and glory unto the Lord. Not only that, you will want to be sanctified. Because as long as that root of sin, the Adamic nature, the propensity for evil, as long as it's remaining in the heart, there will be, will be always this pull that will be dragging you back to things that will be making you to say, Oh, wretched man that I am. When am I going to be true, to, truly free and completely free and totally free? Free within and free without. But when you are sanctified and purified, then you understand that it's going to be easy to really live a life of inward holiness that is according to the will of God. But even after you have been sanctified, that's not enough. You still have some practical things to do and practical steps to take so that you remain holy, righteous in the sight of the Almighty God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 27, but I keep my body, I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I appeal to others, I myself should be a cast away. You have uh, learned uh, in a previous uh, lesson that Job made a covenant with his eyes. Here Paul the apostle said, it's not only the eyes, it's every part of the body. I bring the body under control, under subjection. My eyes, my lips, my ears, and the feelings and the emotions of the body. I bring everything under control, under the control of the Lordship of Christ, and under the control of the scripture. That I will not see, I will not hear, I will not speak anything that will not be according to the will of God. I keep under my body, at home, in the office, in church, with believers, with unbelievers, literally everywhere. I keep under my body. I bring it unto subjection. Let's start preaching to other people. I make myself a cast away. So then, one practical step to take is to make sure that your body comes under the control of the scripture and the spirit of God. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust at her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. It says, here is the Lord saying that many people are defiled because of uh, the steady look and gaze they have upon objects of temptation. 
And those subjects of temptation are almost everywhere in a big city like this. It, but then Jesus Christ pointed out that whosoever, and whosoever means actually whosoever. Whosoever uh, would mean that whatever your position, whatever your calling, and whatever you say you are, whatever experience you are claiming, whosoever looketh. The word look at them is in the continuous present tense. You keep on looking and looking and looking until your body is inflamed, until wrong emotions and wrong thoughts have been excited within you. Whosoever looketh on a woman to lost at her has committed adultery already in his heart. And then he says, What's the solution? If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. That means if uh, a person, a woman like your right eye, a man like your right eye, very precious, very delicate, very important, very indispensable to you, indispensable to your job, indispensable to your career, indispensable to your happiness, indispensable to everything you are trying to get in life, a person as indispensable, as essential, as important as the right eye, if it's a person that is making you constantly to offend the Lord, and you know you want to get to heaven, what is the scriptural, practical thing you have to do? Pluck it out, cast it from thee, because it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. That means you will not take undue liberty with a lady, you will not take undue liberty with a man. If the very thought of the remembrance of the things we did together in the past, even without seeing him, without seeing her, will bring dirty things into your mind, then you know you have a job to do. A job to do. That you need to pluck out. You need to cast out. You need to have a wall of partition between you and that individual. And I'm telling you that when you are doing that, many people will not understand. They will not understand your peculiar problem. They will not understand your besetting sin. They will not understand the covetousness and the loss and the evil desires within you. They will not understand the evil imagination that is coming within you. And every and when they see you like that and you are boycotting that individual, you want to go your way so you can make heaven. That individual is likely to come to you. And it's likely to say, uh, uh, is it because of what happened in the past? Didn't I promise you that it will never happen again? And you can't answer. Because although he promised you, you know what's going on in your heart? You know that every time you see him, it's an object of temptation. Every time you see her, it's an object of temptation. Other people might even come to you and say, we, we look at you, it looks like you're always avoiding sister so and so. Doesn't the Bible say, love one another? And they will even quote scripture and wrap it around your leg and say, if you don't love, if there is an individual in this world you don't love, will you ever get to heaven? They will not understand you, but God who gave the, uh, the cure for this evil thing, he will understand you. Because it says, if your right eye will offend you, will cause you to offend and cause you to be falling into sin, falling into sin, falling into sin and crying and crying and repenting and repenting every time pluck it out because it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell look at verse 30 and these are the words of Jesus Christ if these were the words of an ordinary preacher we might say well that preacher does not understand the grace of God that preacher does not understand the cross of Christ that preacher does not have a balanced message here is Jesus who is going to understand grace more than Christ Understand the cross more than Christ. Understand the provision of the power of God more than Christ. Here is Christ telling us that when it comes to this point, that you know that that sin is hindering you from living a righteous life, this is the only thing to do. But touchy, if the right hand offend thee, causing you to offend every time, cut it off. It's not this literal hand. It's talking about something very useful, very profitable as a hand. And yet it says, you cast it off from you. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members shall perish, and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell. Hell is a reality. It's a place of torment. It's a place of burning fire. It's a place of punishment. It's a place of darkness. It's a place of the gnashing of teeth. It is a place where the worm dies not, and the fire is never quenched. It is a place where the memory will always remember, this is what I should have done, and I didn't do it, and this is what had led me to this eternal place of punishment and torment. And Jesus said, whatever you can do to avoid hellfire, do it, and do it now. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 5. Hebrews chapter 12, Reading from verse 5. It says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto the children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. 
he rebukes, he corrects, he punishes. Whom the Lord loveth, he chastineth. And scourges scourges every son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which correcteth us, and we give them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. He chastises us, he rebukes us. Sometimes he will do that directly. He'll make us feel heavy. He'll make us feel so unhappy. He'll make us feel so miserable because of some things that happen. You'll feel so miserable, you'll not enjoy your food. You'll not enjoy fellowship. You'll not enjoy anything. You know you really overstepped the boundary. You have transgressed against the Lord. And the Lord will make you so miserable concerning the sin you have committed. He does that so that it will drive you on your knees and you'll seek the face of the Lord so that eventually you'll be a partaker of the holiness of God. At other times, he can use the members of the church. You have done something wrong, and this sin that you have done is to the knowledge of the believers. Maybe without anybody even announcing your name, the Lord moves on the hearts of the believers that they are just avoiding you. You come here, they avoid you. You come there, they avoid you. You have no friend, you have no fellowship, you have no joy in the midst of the people of God. And even if you try to run to another church, God wants you to uh, help you out. He puts a mark upon you that even the people there, they are running away from you. Until you say, oh Lord, why is it like this? And the Spirit of God begins to say, already you are taking away from sight your pure people, holy people, righteous people. It's like they are putting you into custody, into the prison. That's why you are having this loneliness and people are running away from you because you are a blemish in the congregation of the righteous it is that chastisement that will drive you to your knees and say oh god i know i've done something wrong i know i've gone astray at other times god can use leadership in the church if those leadership uh, people themselves are living right, if they have the right to do it. Because how can we have a log of wood in our own eyes too? How can we have immorality and then be chastising the people that are immoral? How can we be stealing if we're still in the leadership and then be chastising the people that are stealing? How can we be fighting with our own wives and then be chastising the people that are fighting their families? If we in the leadership too, if we're right, if we're living holy, righteous, just, equitable lives, God can use the leadership to rebuke and chastise the people that have gone wrong and that chastisement whether it's coming from God directly or coming from the members of the church or coming from leadership or coming from your own conscience condemning you telling you that you have gone astray you can't sing you can't laugh you can't rejoice you can't claim the promise of God you can't have the peace of God how can you have the peace of God look at the way you are living and the Lord is allowing your conscience to inflict the chastisement upon you Whichever direction the chastisement is coming from, it is to make you and to make me the partaker of the holiness of God. In um, Psalm 119, verse 9, all through to verse 11. 119 Psalms from verse 9. Where with us shall a young man cleanse his way? How can a young man in this our world be clean? How can a young lady in this environment remain holy and righteous and clean? Wherewith thou shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Oh, you have to be buried in the word, studying the word, examining the word, cleansing yourself in the word of God, chastising yourself, correcting yourself with the word of God, not reading the word of God to preach to other people, not reading the word of God to lead us fellowship, not reading the word of God to uh, be able to bring a verse out to anybody, but reading it for yourself, that you may be kept clean and holy and righteous with my whole heart. In verse 10, have I sought thee with my whole heart? Have I sought thee? You seek him like some people seek money. You, you brush money aside and you seek God. Like some people are seeking progress in life. You brush that aside and with your whole heart, with your whole mind, you are seeking after the Lord. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandment. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Here is the word of God. And uh, the word of God is telling us that these are things that we have responsibility of doing. So that we can live the life that will bring glory unto God. In Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness 
in the fear of God. The Lord is calling us to holiness. And he's saying that we have a responsibility. We need to cleanse ourselves. You need to turn away from anything that is polluting. People may not know it. People may not see it. But you need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be clean. I want to be totally pure. I want to be totally dedicated unto the Lord. So that everything within, everything without will become a dedication of holiness unto the Lord. We can rise up now and really seek the face of the Lord. If we hear the word of God uh, that is coming straight out of the Bible for more than one hour, we should be able to pray for some minutes. And we should be able to get serious. We should be able to know that death can come anytime. The rapture can take place anytime from now. We, know, we should know that the Lord can call us home any moment from now. And yet we know that if you don't settle it with God now, what's the hope you'll be able to make heaven at last? And if you miss heaven, if you miss heaven there is no second chance. There is no second chance. It may be the prayer of this afternoon that will get you ready. It may be the prayer of this afternoon you have the chance to pray before the Lord will call you home. It may be the prayer of this afternoon that the Lord is looking for. And then he will cleanse you. He will forgive you. He will cut off anything that is evil in your life. It may be this is the one single moment in your life when you are sincere. When you are open to the Lord, when with your whole heart, with your whole life, you call upon the Lord, you know the necessity, the indispensability of holiness. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. You brush everything aside. Is there a friend always dragging you to sin? Do something about it. Is there an event in your life always dragging you to sin? Do something about it. Is there a visitation always drawing you into sin? Do something about it. Is there an activity always drawing you into sin? Do something about it. Is there a desire? Is there a thought always dragging you into sin? Do something about it. Is there a position, a responsibility always dragging you into sin? Do something about it. Is there a partnership always dragging you into sin? Do something about it. It. Is there a consideration your own human human characteristic, your own flesh, always dragging you to sin? Do something about it. Is it uh, something that always making you to get angry and fight and quarrel? Is there something that is all make, one, always wanting you to be proud and to be pompous and to flatter yourself? Do something about it. Is there a particular property that is always making you to want to do evil, want to do evil, want to do evil? Do something about it. You see it what you see on the television. That's always coming back to your mind. But looting your mind. You cannot actually live a righteous life. Do something about it. Is it the film show? Is it the movie? Is it the magazine? Is it the pornography that is always calling you back into the old lifestyle? Do something about it. You see the plan of marriage that's always making you to do this and do this and mess up your life. Do something about it. You see the courtship. That is making you to always be dragged back into the mud, dragged back into sin. Do something about it. Is it looking for promotion, looking for position that is always dragging you to do things that are hypocritical, things you don't mean to do, and things that are destroying your life? Do something about it. Is it looking for children? That is making you to go here and go there and get into evil and get into error. Do something about it. What is it you are looking for? Is it your love of money? Is it your business? Always making you to want to do evil. Do something about it. Follow peace with all men without and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And if thy right eye offend thee or make you to sin, pluck it out and cast it away from thee. It is better, it is profitable for you to enter into life with one eye than to get into hell fire with your whole body into fire that never shall be quenched where do you stand today are you a child of god are you born again are you living a righteous life do you know the lord if the trumpet should stand now where will you be if you should die today what hope have you got that you will get to heaven are you sleeping are you only thinking are you daydreaming or are you praying are you only thinking or praying? Are you just having imagination or praying? Are you meditating or praying? Are you just sitting down or praying? Are you just standing up or praying? Are you just repeating words or are you praying? This is the time to seek the face of the Lord. Without holiness, all our labor is in vain. Without holiness, our coming to church is in vain. Without holiness, the profession of salvation is in vain. Without holiness, all the crusades, all the Bible studies are in vain. Without holiness, all the retreats are in vain. 
Without holiness, all the church buildings are in vain. Without holiness, all the paying of tithes is in vain. Without holiness, all the preaching is in vain. Without holiness, all our position, all our authority, everything is in vain. Without holiness, everything we've done in the world and we want to do in the world, everything will be in vain. This is the one single, central, indispensable thing necessary in your life, necessary in my life. We can do without money, we can do without holiness. We can do without position in the church, we can do without holiness. We can do without food, we can do without holiness. We can do without wife, we can do without holiness. We can do without health and provision, we can do without holiness. We can do without accommodation, we can do without holiness. We can do without dressing, we cannot do without holiness. We can do without food, we cannot do without holiness. Holiness is that central, essential, indispensable thing in your life. If you have every other thing, you don't have it, you are all men of all women, the most miserable. How holy are you? How righteous are you? How prepared for heaven are you? How saved are you? How sanctified are you? Are you holy? Are you righteous? Are you a child of God? Are you getting ready for heaven? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Today, people may argue about doctrine, but holiness is indispensable. They may argue about which church to attend, but holiness is indispensable. They may argue about what dressing to put on, holiness is indispensable. If anything you do, anywhere you go, any friendship you have takes holiness away from you, that thing has taken heaven away from you. Heaven away from you. Are you holy? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Offer yourself to, unto the Lord so that everything within, everything without, all things about you will be holiness unto the Lord.